Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Change in the Climate podcast. Of course, as you know, this show is brought to you by Climate Change Realty, the only real estate brokerage that donates 50% of its commissions to nonprofits dedicated to fighting climate change. If you are looking to create climate action on your next real estate transaction, all you have to do is visit ccrealty.org, and we will find you an agent in your area who's willing to offer 50% of their commissions to help save the planet. Now let's dive into the podcast. Jonathan, really great to meet you, man. Thanks so much for taking some time to come on the podcast. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're welcome, man. And you know, we always like to get this show started with some background on who you are and how you got to be doing what you're doing at the current moment. Sure. So I, uh, I am a scientist. I was trained as an entomologist. I have my doctorate to the master's degree in, in insect science and, uh, over time, became much more of an agroecologist, but I sure sure do love bugs still. Um, and uh, worked for the USDA for a number of years, and uh, within that traditional scientific matrix. And then um, and in 2016, I quit and started something totally different: uh, Blue Dasher Farm and Ecdysis Foundation. Um, to try to kind of usher in a uh, revolution in our, in our food system towards regenerative ag and how to use science in order to do that. I'm all on board with that stuff. So tell me this, would you be in, where are you from originally? Minnesota originally, and now we're based in South Dakota. So. Okay. Would you used to go out into the backyard and just start digging holes and looking for bugs when you were a kid? No, not really, but I loved animals. <laughs> I loved animals. And uh, in college, I took an entomology class and, and it was like, I knew I was going to study biology. I knew I would study animal biology. And then these little critters, you know, they're everywhere around us. There was no shortage of questions to ask. And bio entomologists like to joke that we're the biologists that have jobs because there is <laughs> there is an actual need for a lot of entomology out there in terms of pest management and invasive species and all these other elements. I think you could make the argument that the need right now is is larger than ever because we're seeing unprecedented loss in, um, all I know is that there's unprecedented loss in biomass of insect populations, which is deeply disturbing to me because they're kind of like the, well, they're not the foundation, but they're an important part of the ecosystem. And I'm sure we'll, we're going to get into talking about entomology. But before we do, I do want to talk a bit about your experience at the USDA Agriculture Research Service, like how long you worked mm -hmm. there and uh, what made you decide to, to leave. Yeah, um, I was I worked at USDA for around 11 years and uh, it was a great place to start my career. And uh, but yeah, things started to change as I stayed in there longer and I asked started asking some of the wrong questions. Um, in terms of risk assessment of pesticides and genetically modified crops, and um, and starting to question, you know, how we how we approach ecological risk assessments, and then also whether or not overinvesting in a few large agricultural commodities was really the best choice for our food system and our national security, really, and. Um, right. And so, you know, while I was there, I, I yeah, I kind of, yeah, I was named one of the top young scientists in the country and I got to meet President Obama in the White House. But then it all started to fall apart when I started asking some of those uh, inconvenient questions and finding inconvenient things about what was happening with our food system. And then I grew I mean, I drive through Eastern South Dakota or Iowa or something like this and, and just kind of like shaking your head, like, my goodness, it, my science is being used to generate this, yeah, this, this food system. And that didn't feel right anymore. It, it, we needed to rethink how science was being applied in order to make some change call it a food system or call it a large scale extinction of microbiology depends on how you want to word it you know um what 
the, what exactly is the USDA? What, what do they like do? What's their stated purpose? Because we're paying for it with our tax dollars. So are they the ones that are subsidizing crops? And like, what exactly do they do? They do? Well, they do a lot of things. Uh, there's many branches of the USDA. It's the smallest fragment of the uh, or a very small fragment of the total federal budget, which most of it goes into in the Department of Defense. And I think uh, some of the health care and stuff like that. Um, so it's a pretty sure. fine segment of that budget. But with it, they do an awful lot. Of, they're responsible for our food system, the farm bill, all of the policies, you know, uh, farm insurance. Um, they have agricultural research service. They have the um, economic research service, I think, is still under USDA and, and uh, some granting programs, things like that. So you say they're responsible for our food system, but I, I think what you really mean is they're responsible for regulating our food system because the government is not growing the food. It's all individual farmers like yourself who are growing and there are private enterprises that are always growing all of our food, right? Correct. Yeah. So yeah, the, the USDA is the agricultural arm of, of the federal government. Okay. And I mean, I don't want to point blame one way or the other but i guess we didn't really understand soil science until very recently so it's hard to place the blame on a regulatory body for not understanding that we're degrade why we're degrading the the place where all the food grows but um let's let's talk about that in relation to your understanding of insects so, so how did your interest in insects eventually lead you to want to begin working specifically in the agricultural sector um, well, uh, there was an applied question to trying to solve or to working with insects, um, within agriculture. So, so there was, there was problems to solve with, with entomology. And, and so that, that brings a lot of entomology. It's a unique field within agricultural science though, because, because entomologists get into the field of entomology because they love insects almost invariably. And so that changes our approach to how we think about bugs. You look at other segments. I mean, um, you know, weed scientists don't get into weed science because they love plants. Plant pathologists don't get into it. Uh, you know, plant pathology because they love viruses or something like that. So they, usually they come into it from a, standpoint of an agronomy background and then and then uh, find the discipline within that agronomy background and entomology is a little bit different they tend to come in from a, from a biological sciences background or ecology and then find agronomy as as, as one place to try career did you have a particular insect i don't i don't know if it's species or a particular like a bug that you were fascinated by Always. Um, well, there's no shortage, right? Uh, so I think initially there's these parasitoid wasps that were particularly interesting to me. Uh, they, they don't sting people. They actually lay their eggs in other insects and, uh, and, and then devour those insects. The larvae of the wasp devours the insect from the inside out. It's crazy. Um, and then I got into more, um, lady beetles so ladybugs um i really enjoy coccinellids and then uh, and then i became a uh yeah kind of a leader in in carabid beetles which is a group a really diverse group of ground beetles that are really important in agriculture now dragonflies i really love dragonflies Dragonflies are cool too. They're always flying around having sex, aren't uh, they? No, not always, but sometimes, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, they need a break too. Yeah, we we all need a break, man. Have you ever read um, Ender's Game? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, what a great book. It's a great audio book too. The discussion of bugs makes me it makes me think of that. How we just don't understand their world at yeah. all, and the lack of communication leads to leads to warfare, and that happens between humans too, Absolutely. still to this day. Absolutely. So, can you share shed a bit of light on how the in, these insect populations coexist with us and actually help us live our lives? What kind of benefit are we getting from having insects? Because maybe if someone if I tell someone that we've lost seventy percent of insect biomass in the last thirty years, that's like to me that's crazy. But like someone might be like, eh, you know, mosquitoes are annoying. So, what kind of benefits are we getting from coexisting with these organisms? 
Um, well, we wouldn't be here without them. Uh, so uh, uh, where go the insects, so go we. Um, and and so, yeah, and, and we're watching that happen too, aren't we, with, with our infertility rates increasing and, and our autoimmune diseases and food intolerances and things along these lines. This isn't just the insect apocalypse. This is also a major threat to humankind. Uh, uh, what do insects do? They, you know, I mean, they pollinate our food. So most fruits and vegetables that you get at the grocery store, thank a bud. Um, they, they, uh, they are the basis of wildlife. So people that are like watching birds or hunting or fishing, think an insect. Um, their nature's insecticides, their nature's herbicides. They regulate communities of what are called pests by our perspective and the natural world doesn't recognize them as so, but you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? I mean, there's a, a most of the colors and the, the smells and the flavors of our world are, are the result of plant defenses against insects. You know, most of your spice cabinet, those flavors are because the plants are defending themselves against herbivory. Uh, most of your perfumes and things like this, those are plants uh, and, and, and their defense against herbivory so, uh, by insects. So think about for a lot of those things. So, so the idea kind of being that we've co-evolved with these organisms, so we're kind of dependent on them for the way we live our lives and the stuff that we use every single day. Absolutely. Like yeah, the main yeah. idea. And that's true of all life, not just bugs. But, um, yeah, we've become really disconnected from that, haven't we? in our, in our urban lives. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really fundamental shift in, in, in our species that I think is leading to many of the problems that we're facing right now. Yeah. I mean, just generally a lack of respect for living things, I think is, is generally problematic in my eyes. Um, so speaking of which, how do we currently go about what we might call pest management how are we killing these insects like what's the main way we're going about doing that um insecticides right yeah uh, so if you buy a jug and it kills bugs that's um yeah so sprays and seed seed treatments um crop seeds or plant seeds that you buy at the garden store or, yeah, those are important ways so at this stage in the in the United States, how much insecticides are, are we spraying on like an annual basis? I just saw it yesterday outside my apartment, these guys with backpacks on and spray bottles just walking around. And is that really like necessary? I mean, we just have like green grass planted outside the apartment, you know, so they're spraying it so that the insects don't come and eat, eat the grass. Like what's the whole, what's the main point of this? Uh, maybe it could have been herbicides or fungicides or, you know, whatever. Okay. Um, but, yeah, when there's a problem there, or even a perceived risk of a problem, then that ends up, yeah, prompting a spray. Well, I mean, I know some people have, like, serious allergies to that stuff. And it's all it's all fossil fuel-based, typically, no? Um, not, I guess so. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The you know, it's a neurotoxin. I think that's where they originally were created. So. Well, the idea of spraying toxins on living things just does, sounds kind of counterintuitive to me. Are you aware of any like the primary risks that pest management poses to our ecosystems? Uh, reduction of biodiversity in life is kind of the is probably the main mechanism by which pesticides affect us. And that simplification of our landscapes are, is only able to be maintained through, through agrochemical use. So, uh, yeah, in a nutshell, that's it. Um, and then there's, of course, direct effects of pesticides on, on, um, on our own health and uh, well-being. So speaking of biodiversity, let's get into this topic because it's obviously something you're very interested in now, specifically on farmland. So what what are the benefits of not spraying toxins and killing off all the different life and actually like promoting biodiversity? How does that actually improve like the food that we're, we're growing? Um, so 
you know, natural systems function based on life, right? On, on natural cycles of, of species interacting with each other to cycle nutrients and provide um, those back to plants. And when you remove a lot of life from the a farm or your garden or something like this, then you end up seeing uh, you have to replace those ecosystem functions uh, that life used to perform with with an agrochemical, um, and so fertilizers or pesticides or things like this. So how does it affect us? You know, I mean, it it provides the nutritional basis of our food. Uh, healthy food comes from healthy soils, and the only way you get healthy soils is with life. Um, the only way you get carbon sequestration is with life. Yeah, I love the the multifaceted benefits of soil health restoration. Not only does it sequester carbon, but it provides a foundation for even more life. Here's something I wanted to talk to you about that I think is very interesting. A couple of years ago, I worked for an accelerator and there was a company in the accelerator called Cowboy Crickets and they were growing crickets for food. And I think that's something that we don't think of in the in the West or in the U.S. as food insects. So it's it would seem to me that instead of killing all these insects, should we perhaps be like farming these insects? Because there seem to be like a really rich source of protein, at least crickets are. What is your what are your thoughts on, on that eating insects for food? Sure. I mean, it's a new form of livestock and you can treat it like that. Um, that's not going to get us out of our biodiversity crisis, but uh, certainly sure. the uh, uh, eating insects. I mean, Western cultures are one of the only ones on the planet that don't rely on insects and their kin as a major source of protein in their diet. So, um, yeah, crab legs, lobster, you know, people like to eat those things that that's a big bug, uh, whether it's or not. <laughs> really, it's that it's that prolific around the world. It's yeah. just in like it's around just us. us. Yeah, it's, it's not... us in Europe, basically. Um, but don't really. Yeah, yeah. So I was in China, and at the farmers market, you could buy uh, fried fried grasshoppers right there. So we tried them out. They're delicious. Do they do they farm them then out there in China? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes they do, and sometimes all, all it takes is, yeah, collecting them from where they're kind of becoming a problem. Where do you think that that came from? That we we just we don't do that. It seems like it would be just as plentiful a resource as a cow or a mm -hmm. sheep. You know, it's a good question. I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, there's a connotation that insects are associated with rotting foods and things like that. Maybe that's it. I don't know, but. Um, the locust plagues, I mean, that was one of the most prevalent sources of food on the, in many parts of the, of the world, the large savannas of the world. And, uh, and instead of thinking of those as a resource, yeah, they, we thought of them as a pest. And, um, so yeah, those, yeah. So the locusts were coming through and eating all the crops, and you're saying that why didn't they just turn around and just pick up the locusts and eat them instead of the crops? Yeah, it was actually probably a better source of protein than anything they could have grown on those crops, anyways. So yeah, fry them up. Yeah, I mean it's it's weird. I, it seems like what is it? So I mean, just in the U.S., so we got cows, we eat sheep, we eat pigs, we eat chickens. And then we have like salmon and tuna and that's pretty much it. And if it seems like if those are like six different species, it seems like there'd be so many other things that we could be eating that could potentially be more nutritionally valuable um, in many, in many ways. I don't know, I guess. And efficient too, you know, I mean, insects are the most efficient form of protein out there uh, in terms of transferring, you know, dietary, you know, inputs into protein. Uh, that, that doesn't get much more efficient than than some insect species, and they do taste really good actually. When you're when you, yeah, sometimes you got to pick off the wings and the legs. But <laughs> what uh, what else have you had besides grasshopper and crickets? Um, we'll eat bee grubs every once in a while. I, you know, I mean, we don't know it, but we eat insects with most bites of food. Uh, there's actual federal regulations as far as how many uh, caterpillars can be in a can of corn or, uh, or uh, you know, 
bug legs and a can of peas or whatever. So. I'm just thinking like Hakuna Matata. What a wonderful phrase. And, then, and they're eating, they just start eating all the bugs. Yeah. They make it look pretty good in the cartoon. Yeah, I'm not going to yeah, lie. Well, well, there you have it. Yeah. Cool, man. All right. Do you want to tell me a bit about the work you're doing at, how is it pronounced? Ectisis. Ectisis. Ectisis Foundation. Yeah. yeah. Tell me a bit about that. Uh, sure. So we kind of started uh, to rethink how science is applied in this uh, space of regenerative agriculture. Uh, about, well, this is our seventh season. So, um, and uh, yes, uh, so we the first step in that process is we believe that scientists have to kind of become farmers and that changes the questions that we ask as well as how we ask them. Um, and that led to this sort of relationship intensive form of science where the scientists become a part of food communities again. And, and that's been a really important tool for us to help use science make change. It's not just about a data a uh, point or or something like this it's actually you know i mean the farmers actually see our faces and and they get to meet us and realize you know these are these are human beings so you say scientists need to become farmers but you don't say that farmers need to become scientists why is that um well sure scientists or farmers could be the could become scientists too uh you know honestly though they're different skill sets and I hope the farmers focus on farming and scientists can focus on science and, and working together, we form a, a symbiosis there that can really help to advance our food system. But right now, and I think maybe for too long, scientists felt that they were the experts and that they were intended to fill the, the, the empty vessel of the farming community with our knowledge. and that's has led to a real chasm between between the scientific community and the people that we're trying to help. Yeah, one thing I wanted to ask you based on your your previous experience with research is like what are some of the issues you have with conducting these control studies where they just look at one single variable without looking things at like a full systems approach because when we talk about something like ag, like life in the soil it's like a a, a galaxy of trillions of organisms. So I just wanted to get your, your perspective on that and how we currently conduct scientific research around topics like this. Oh, it is, so we'll read a lot of science as part of our uh, our weekly discussion groups within uh, within our within our team here, and it's actually kind of frustrating to see how myopic a lot of studies are in terms of you know they're not thinking about this outside of their little nucleus. Um, and that leads to a false perception of reality. Um, and, yeah, so we try to focus on systems, um, and that's really the, been the most important focus of our scientific research. Um, the, in, the natural world is nearly infinitely complex. How on earth can we, um, can we even hope to try to understand all of the mechanisms that are at play Yet we know that farmers are really generating successful food systems, in spite of the science a lot of times. And so that gets into this grayer area of, you know, until science really catches up with what these farmers are doing, it becomes a real action of, of faith more than science, doesn't it? So what are these farmers doing? They're just testing things based on their own experiences and moving forward with what they learn? Well, they're getting, they're getting shit done, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's the difference, <laughs> right? Uh, so We need them to. The, between, so I wear a couple of hats here at Blue Dasher, and, and one of them is, you know, the farm, and, and the other is the science. And so you're, you're presented with problems, right? And the scientific John says, okay, well, we have to understand this uh, problem and we have to replicate, you know, and see or whether or not a solution is truly optimal and test several options under a controlled system. Meanwhile, the farmer side of John is like, 
all right, the sheep just broke fence. Uh, I got to get this done. Uh, I don't have time for a replicated experiment. I'm going to take the best information that I have at that moment and pull the trigger. And uh, that is a much different world. Those two sides of what I'm trying to do are very different worlds. And that's sort of changed our perspective on science. We don't have time to make mechanistic experiments right now. That will be necessary in the future for optimizing things. But right now, what we really need to be doing is allowing this learning, taking a step back and humbly watching the farmers that have successfully made a, a, a viable regenerative system. And, um, and then using our science, we can, we can try to understand how to scale that or, or transfer that or replicate that across different food systems, across different regions. Where is this time constraint you're talking about coming from? Uh, we have about 10 years left. Um, of soil? Of, of life on Earth. Of life on Earth. Uh, so we hear that term that we're losing soil and the topsoil will be gone in, I don't know, 50 years now, maybe 45 years. Uh, but when you look at extinction rates, most of life on Earth at current extinction rates are, is going to be gone in that same time increment. You can't wait until that 44th year to change things. Um, the writing of the trajectory of our planet it needs to happen now. We have about ten years, right. I estimate, before we have to, before we can't reverse it. How does that perspective shape the actions that you take each day? Um, it's a constant pressure. Uh, it's, it, yeah. I mean, I feel personally responsible, um, and 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 I think we all should. We certainly all need to be feeling that personal responsibility, and that leads me to, you know, the status quo isn't getting us where we have to be, right? Uh, small experiments, you know, or focused on certain things, uh, elements of a system. That isn't getting us where we have to be. And so we, yeah, this last year we launched the Thousand Farms Initiative where we'll be working on the largest agricultural experiment that's ever been even attempted, where we do full systems assessments on regenerative farms across the United States and Canada. Yeah, t tell me more about that. H how, how does that work? Like which farms are signing up and what are you hoping to learn? Um, well, the experiment has been, it's supposed to do a couple of things. Number one, test whether regenerative ag works no matter what you grow or where you're growing it. Um, number two, farmers are developing successful plans for how to transition to a regenerative system. And they're cutting their teeth on it, right? Um, what can we learn from those transition processes to provide roadmaps to, for, so that farmers can remove a lot of risk that are um, worried about making that next step? And then, um, you know, we're, we're communicating those results, but we're also, you know, kind of asking this question is, does regenerative agriculture really deliver on these promises of things like, so of carbon sequestration and reversal of desertification and improvement of rural communities and human health and and is strengthening biodiversity. So, yeah, that's the goal. Um, so right. we're going to be doing these sampling protocols on thousands of farms every year for the next three to five years, um, trying to accumulate that incontrovertible data that we desperately need right now to show that this is a viable path forward. So when you come to your personal way of dealing with the reality of the Anthropocene extinction event, your idea is to focus specifically on soil health because it can be the foundation of biodiversity globally. Is, is that kind of the idea I'm getting, um, I'm getting from you or 40% of the terrestrial land surfaces is, is our food system. It's a lot. Um, so it's at 40%. Um, and we manage that. That makes it, yes, that's been the source of a lot of the problems that we're facing right now, but it's also the solution. Mm -hmm. And so I choose to focus on that. I think that that's our best shot out of this mess. Uh, yeah. It ain't about 
you know, recycling a tin sure. can, that's that empowering and all of that. Sorry, I've been recycling since I was a kid. Uh, yeah, take a look around you. Has it gotten any better? Mm. No, we need better. We need faster. Um, so it, what we need is to change ourselves culturally, fundamentally. Mm-hmm. This isn't just a buying an electric car. What is it then? What, what ideally? How would you want? We need to slow down. Slow down, like degrowth kind of thing. We need to. We need to. Our society needs to slow down. We need to turn off our phones. We need to connect with the natural world. We've lost that. I mean, that there's something about being human that that means that we are connected with life around us animals and plants and until that happens you know the, we're, we're just a society that's lost we're just lost so to me if i had a magic wand to save the planet it isn't regen ag it isn't you know uh solar power it isn't any of these things it's making everybody in this planet take their socks and shoes off and walking out in a prairie or walking out in a mountain, you know, side or something and feeling the natural world with all of your senses and experiencing that reconnection um, because that's the only way that we're going to get out of this. Do you take the time every day to go out and do that? Every day. Yeah. And you live on Blue Dasher Farm, right? Yeah. Um, c- can you tell me the, the origin story of how you, how you ended up there and what it turned into? I'm, I'd am i like, I'd like to start a farm at one point. That'd be cool. <laughs> uh, well, I had just gotten my ass handed to me again by the USDA. I was in uh, Pennsylvania and I, uh, in Washington, D.C., speaking to growers and to the National Academy of Sciences. And I didn't have my paperwork. My travel paperwork wasn't all signed. So, um, and so that, you know, I was facing uh, suspensions because I didn't sign. I was talking about risks of genetically modified crops to farmers and to, to the National Academy of Sciences, which is my job, right? That's my job. And, uh, Winter storm hit, horrible blizzard. Me and Gail Fuller, he's a good friend of mine, farmer friend down in Kansas, we're stuck there. And uh, I'm like, well, let's, all the flights are canceled. Let's drive. And on that trip, I'm, I was stressed, right? I was like, my whole life is falling apart here. I'm no longer the golden boy of the USDA. Everything that I thought I knew has is, is been monkeyed up. I need something different. And uh, on that trip, I yeah, I came up with this concept of, of a farm that's grassroots science coupled with experiential knowledge. And uh, we ended up crowdfunding it. We uh, put on an Indiegogo campaign and uh, got it funded by people from all over the world and uh, through small donations. They... And they bankrolled a new farm and research facility in regenerative ag. So that's where that's our origin story. Uh, there's a lot more blood, sweat, and tears that go into that, but um, a terrifying, terrifying time of my life. You got people to crowdfund a farm that you now own and live on. Yeah. All right. Duly noted. I'm going to keep that in the back pocket. Oh, I don't know if that's a formula for success. It was. Uh, yeah, but it worked in our case. Yeah, well, I love the idea of creating a, a place where people can go to learn and be part of like a community of that's just dedicated to fostering more life into the world. That's the definition of what a farm is. It exists to grow things and create more life and and then sustain life by selling your products to other people who will then eat it and continue to grow and live. I love that. So um, where where have you seen from when you first kind of involved in this stuff, the, the regenerative agriculture movement now in 2022 compared to like when you first started like dipping a toe in this stuff? It's crazy how quickly this is taking off. 
Uh, it's probably been one of the fastest social movements in our food system that's ever happened. <laughs> I mean, genetically modified crops would be the the last, you know, quickest thing that's really swept the nation or the world's food supply. Uh, regenerative ag is, I mean, it started just, I don't know, when we got started, regenerative ag was a term, but it was just brand new in the vernacular. Mm. I mean, it had been coined back in the 80s or even earlier, but the uh, in practice or in acceptance, it was you know, not there, you know. Uh, now, I mean, it's in mainstream publications, large corporations are wanting regenerative food systems, yada, yada, yada. So it's, it's really gone from zero to 150 miles an hour in a very short amount of time. It's crazy that we're, yeah, I mean, I pushed all my chips onto the table on this whole regenerative thing, and it was a good bet. Certainly. So... Unfortunately, you and I, well, I don't really want the power, but we don't have magic wands, so we can't get people to go out and, and be the way we want them to. So what what can people do in their daily lives to support uh, biodiversity and stopping the continued loss of life? The reality of the situation is more and more people are going to be living in urban environments. So what can someone like that do to support biodiversity and health on the planet? Um, number one is know your, know your farmer, uh, know where your food is coming from, support that. Number two is, uh, you have space that you're in charge of, um, grow a garden regeneratively and use that to cook your own food. Stop going out to eat all the time. Stop with processed foods, start eating whole food. That's critical. Um, dig up your lawns and plant something different. Uh, diversity of plants uh, in and around you. Um, slow down. Turn your phone off. Use it about half as much as you did last week. Um, does it make you any happier to have that thing constantly buzzing in your ear all the time? Um, Walk instead of drive. I don't know. Slow down. Quit your job. And, and yeah, you, you need one income. For, you look at all the other currencies that are out there uh, that are extremely beneficial. And for families, you know, having somebody at home is really important right now. Um, and restoring that fabric to our society is so, so important. We're losing it so rapidly. Yeah, don't everybody. No, I get it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so. catching the vibe you're putting down. Man. <laughs> do you watch TV or movies, or do you go on social media at all? I'm on a little bit, you know. Uh, usually, I, yeah, I don't follow anybody on online or anything like that. Um, we'll watch a, sh a show as a family or something in the evenings, uh, just to kind of unwind or something. You don't feel the pull of the dopamine addiction to just get more and more every day? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, when I'm monitoring a post or something like that, I, I totally understand why people are addicted. Um, but then I can, yeah, I, I can put it away. Why do you think there's so little emphasis on the biodiversity crisis and so much emphasis on the climate situation? They're inextricable, aren't they? Um, sure. I think... People understand it's, it's, uh, I don't know. People can connect with the fact that, I mean, in, in our community last week, a derecho wind of, it was, it was a wall of mud and soil that went up into the heavens and it came in at about 100 miles an hour and wiped out tons of properties. People can connect with that. They understand that extremes are the new normal. Um, maybe they just haven't been experiencing the life on their farms from that perspective in so long that they've forgotten that that's how we're going to fight this crisis. And then there's another corporate side that I think has a tremendous mm -hmm. influence. You know, the currencies that we seem to value are, sure. are dollars and uh, 
and and there's ways of easily making money off of this carbon. There's been a lot of emphasis on that, but uh, the reality is that if unless we're using life and and food systems, not just carbon, uh, we're yeah. There's going to be enough cheaters mm-hmm. that end up coming in that end up destroying any benefits from, from carbon credits. It's and, something to be wary of. Jonathan, I've appreciated hearing your perspective today. Very. It's a, it's an interesting one and there's a lot of merit behind every, with the stuff that you're saying. And it concerns me the, the lack of cons- the lack of respect for other life on this planet, but we're going to have to see where it goes. Well, beyond this podcast, what are you doing? What are you doing in your own life? What am I doing in my own life? Well, I wake up at, I used to wake up at 4.30. Now I wake up at 5.30. I get up, I eat organic oatmeal, and then I sit at a desk for 12 hours and try to build a real estate business. Or I go and I sell houses. And any of the money I make, I donate half of it to people like you who are doing the work I need. So I'm trying to use my life as a vessel to support folks like you but I don't have the scientific mind or the skill set to create solutions. So I'm trying to use finance to support people. So I spend all my time working on that. That's what I do. I don't grow plants. I try not to drive, mostly because I don't like it. And I exercise like bloody hell, 13, 14 hours a week. That's what I do. Yeah. Well, that's important. Uh, the plant side, yeah, I would, uh, yeah. I think that's a really important. I eat, pl- I eat plant-based. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I eat all. I eat all plants. Do you? Okay, so you're a vegetarian. Yeah. yeah. Vegan, yeah. Vegan. Okay. Um, yeah. Nope. I think that's that's all great. Yeah. So it's wonderful. I'm glad you're doing those things. I wish more people did. Do people ask you about it? Do they wonder? You know, why is he, why are you doing this? When I get to talk to people like you, they they might ask they might ask me, yeah. I guess I guess anyone anyone asks, and I I give the response that, like I said, I say I'm a very visionary thinker, so I like to think from the end backwards. And I I was very really really interested in finance. I studied business, and I was always con- I was in in that that trap of tr- the build wealth, build wealth, become free, have your glamorized life. But once I finally had a, um, a template given to me by someone who had previously built a real estate business, I had a vision where as long as I take these steps, I'm going to have a lot of money. The first thing I thought, because I think from the end back, is what am I going to do with the money? And I wanted to use it to improve the world. So that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing because I have an innate desire to do that. And as I've gone deeper and deeper, I've become infatuated with regenerative economics and the idea of using money to create more life on the planet. And I um, I talked to some degrowth people and, and, and folks who think we should have less. I, I'm, I'm quite opposed to the idea of reducing the human population to save the planet because I think if, if everyone were to become stewards, we would have even more life now. Do, do you, can you kind of see how I've, I think that way? Yep. Yeah. Oh, I, I totally agree. I don't think that we're overpopulated yet. I think, yeah, emphasizing how we use the people that we have is really key. Exactly. So what if everyone was a farmer? Then we would have endless amounts of plants and animals would be eating from the garden. We wouldn't need pesticides because there'd be so many people growing food that the animals wouldn't be going from scrap to scrap to scrap. There'd be food. There'd be enough for everyone. I believe in this excess economy and we are not there because of a lot of stuff we discussed on this podcast today. The ideas of of reductionism and, and looking at one input and trying to really focus on that. And that's the same issue with carbon I've come to realize when it comes to tackling the climate solution. But it's it's too deep for the average person to to even begin to wrap their head around. Yeah. I mean, I think your idea is even better. It's just like something you, it's, there's no words when you take your shoes off and you walk through a field, it just feels like this is what we were meant to do. I mean, it's what we used to do. We would, we would run through the fields and that would, is, there's a lot, there's a lot to it is what I'll say. We had animals around us all the time that we were in charge of, you know, that we cared for, not, not, designer dogs or cats that's fine that's actually probably replaced uh something that's a fundamentally human that livestock used to have in our lives 
Um, but yeah, yeah, data isn't enough, is it? Uh, we need mm-hmm. to connect. We need to feel it um, in order to be effective in the change. I really believe that if even there might be a split now between metrics and data and nature and connections, I really believe that we can use our cognitive abilities and our emotional sides to connect these two things together so they 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 build off of each other. I really believe someone called me a uh, what was the word what's the word and uh, like a modern environmentalist, like someone who believes we can use technology to improve nature. Um, I think it depends on how we use it, doesn't of course. it? Because not to make money. Technology can also, yeah, right. And technology can lead to complacency and laziness if we replace if we replace biology with technology. That's a problem. Uh, if we enhance biology with technology, that's the solution. What do you think of the school system in this country? I think they're terrified. The teachers or the students are both. Oh, I think both, but the teachers certainly are terrified and the, they survive by working within a rigid framework that doesn't allow for a lot of evolution to happen. And um, that's not their fault. No. Um, um, and I think that they want to do good, um, but boy, there's a lot of politics involved right now are not intended to be. We had, uh, I brought my kids down. We lived in Colombia for a little while. Um, and they went to a Colombian school. And the first thing that happened was my little boy went into the school and the teacher gave him a big, big hug. And it was like, <laughs> it was like that doesn't happen in the U S school system at all, but it was really important for him. I think it was really important. Uh, yeah, we're we're so scared that we're losing something that we didn't even know could be lost. I mean, what are we? Yeah, I mean, what are we even scared of? I feel like m- most people are are scared of them themselves. They're they're afraid to look introspectively and and think about who they really are fundamentally. Um, yeah, I think so too. And and that they have that mm-hmm. number one, they're responsible. Um, and then accepting yourself because yeah, we're all, we're all fragile creatures and, um, accepting that and then, and then moving forward and, and realizing that you you can't have a difference. Even one, it takes one little pebble to start an avalanche. That's a crisis. That's our mantra. We want to be the pebble that starts the avalanche that saves this planet or at least one of the pebbles. Totally. Or it takes one huge project that you move infrastructure around and re-wet an area like a mangrove and all of a sudden life just comes back flourishing immediately. As long as we remove the, if you take your foot off someone's neck, they'll start to breathe again. And that's what nature does. And that's what's so, that's what keeps me so optimistic and positive about this stuff is that we do have the power to change. And it's not going to take a big f it won't take a huge massive effort to bring everything back it, it it's a it's a reinforcing system Absolutely. natural systems we just have to like i said take our foot off their throat you know oh, yeah we have tremendous opportunities i've watched you know i'm sure uh, habitats and ecosystems resurge within a year even right. and we've documented that we'll be publishing on that very shortly uh one billionaire could save the planet at this point if they wanted to. You really think that? Huh. Um, oh, 100%. 100%. It would be easy. But I just think, you know, I mean, if they really wanted it, what would they, they'd what have would to they connect do? with the problems. They'd have to connect with the problems that they're trying to solve. They, they wouldn't be grandstanding or, or anything like that. They'd have to get, get their hands dirty. Um, and, yeah, come out with our scientific staff and we'll show you what, what, what's the issue. We'll show you the solutions to the issue too. Um, so I don't know, uh, but they don't want to. I'll give it to you, Jonathan. You've got some interesting ideas. I can't deny it. It's been, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Do you, um, do you have any final pieces of advice for young people who are in, in, this, in this life right now, living in the world that we live? 
Absolutely. Yeah, there is good thing. God, it just feels so hopeless right now, doesn't it? I mean, we're just up against these problems that are monumental. But I would encourage you because there is good that is happening right now. Find it. Find those people that are truly trying to change things. Not the pamphleteers, not the talkers, but the people that are actually, that are, that are, doing something and help them. You don't have to lead it. Eventually you will, but you don't have to start that way. There are leaders that are out there. Find those people and devote your lives to this. It is so important right now. Couldn't agree more. Jonathan, I appreciate the time. Likewise. Take care. You got it. All right, everybody. So if you or anyone else you know is looking to buy or sell a home anywhere in the USA and would like to create thousands of dollars in donations without any cost out of pocket, please visit ccrealty.org today.